Good morning, everyone. It's 7.14 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 19. <clears throat> 2022 years from an unknown date at this point in time. I want to thank, once again, <clears throat> the person who sent me uh, this article by Christopher Pfister, A New Manifesto to Revise Prevailing History and Chronology. And now I'm not going to, probably not going to read much from this or or at all uh, in this video, <clears throat> but I did want to say again uh, a thanks for that, and here's why. Even though the author hasn't yet <clears throat> done much of any c citations to his claims, um, when he gets here to the um, the portions where he actually names a number of older authors who did the, uh, uh, it seems like that lamp behind me is really bright. <clears throat> I was going to kick back, but maybe I should come forward or else I'm just going to be drowned out. In light from that, it's only 60 watts. It's frosted. Anyways, when he gets into these sources, those are some really interesting sources. One thing I've come to find out myself, too, is that <laughs> some of the most helpful sources that anyone who's looking into the falsification of, I shouldn't even say history, but the falsification of anything, if you don't fluently read German, French, and, and Spanish, mostly French and German, or German and French, because it's hard for me to say which order. Um, boy, are you are at a disadvantage. So, I punched in a lot of these sources. Of course, I went to archive.org trying to uh, locate what works there were by these people, if the works that he listed when he did list works by them were available. Unfortunately, a few of these, I was having trouble even finding in a, just a, a standard search engine, not to mention archive. Archive, just pff, nothing. And that's, with some of these, that's super, super unfortunate. Um, because, uh, well, a couple of them, the information he's talking about um, is really, if it's out there, I think it's going to offer some pretty excellent detail. Anyways, I did find the probably the two main books by this guy, Wilhelm Kamier. German, they're written in German. The English translations of them are uh, the falsification of the history of Germany, and the other one, the falsification of the history of the early Christians or early Christianity. Both topics, if you follow my work, both topics are intrinsically linked. The only other topic he could have written on that would have been just as important as those two is if he had possibly written uh, the falsification of the histories, or I'm sorry, uh, the falsification of the history of the Gauls. That is the only other topic I know that would have been just so equally uh, appropriate. But that's another story, just as important, though. So what I did was, there's only, ver uh, only German versions available. I'm telling you about this because I, I published these two books in English. And how I did it was like this, and I, I have read uh, portions of them since I did the English conversion. 
they're clunky and that happens especially when you use digital translators but they're readable you can understand where he's going with some of these things they need fine-tuning and actually if anybody out there is a fluent German speaker um, I have I have the original in German most of what he published is in the the gothic looking text that very old German gothic looking text and that doesn't translate well you can't really pull that from a PDF and put it into Google Translate because Google Translate won't even recognize most of those characters so you have to find an updated version that that pretty much has more modern German so I did I managed to find two versions that had the more modern German looking text um, downloaded those PDFs I had to break them apart because Google Translate will only do PDFs up to 300 pages keep that in mind um, but if you have a subscription for instance to Adobe Acrobat DC which I do and it is paid for by donation money um, this is always what donation money goes into and then when I have all of the tools that I think I need to um, actually put money into then the donation money goes into freeing up my time so that I can do more of this work you can go to um, and I think they actually even offer it if you don't have um, a subscription to uh, Adobe Acrobat DC but you're not going to be able to get that put on the cloud and then just be able to get it right onto your computer whenever you want it's so that parts you know subscription so I took those two parts and I then uh, download them on, on my computer and Google Translate has a feature where you can just upload a full document as long as it's under 300 pages and you can go between these languages whether it's German French Spanish whatever old uh, books you find you have to make sure that the text is readable and that's another thing that Adobe Acrobat DC will do is you can pull in a book that may not have readable text so it's just a scan and you use the OCR function and you designate what language you want it to um, define extract text from if you go to archive and you you want to download a book and I download pretty much everything in PDF if I can just absolutely can't find a book in PDF then it'll be downloaded uh, I, I don't do EPUB unless I have to um, or there's a there's a couple other um, book programs where sometimes you just you just have to like there's one uh, called deja vu and sometimes you can't find these certain things on any in any other type of file so yeah you can recognize text load it into Google Translate they will translate it usually only takes a few seconds um, under a minute and then they will give you the option to re-download that you can then open them up into Acrobat and combine files rename it put it in a location now you have a full file I uploaded those two books in that Google Translate English full uh, continuous books uh, to that stolen history site they have a library there those two books are uploaded into the library and sorry about the snap my dog is um, loud <laughs> she uh, yeah she gets really loud when she sleeps I I, I kind of wonder what she's dreaming about why she's on <laughs> that loud um, that's weird animal dreams I wonder what animals dream about because they do clearly appear to be dreaming she does so anyways it's stolenhistory.net they have a library you can go to that library and those two PDFs in the Google Translate English are on there as well as the PDF version of bringing it all together I put it up there I don't know if that's been approved yet um, and with you know with as much as I point some fingers at a particular group I you know I have to wonder if they might not approve it and if they don't I'm really I'm gonna have to protest because here's they allow all kinds of finger pointing at Jesuits and and particular people 
But, you know, if they're going to have a sacred cow, that's not okay. But we'll see. Maybe maybe they will. Um, the It looks like the admin, he's actually posted articles concerning uh, Germany and Germans' history and, and all of that. And actually, they're working on a... Um, so that Stolen History YouTube channel is a... I think it's um, a, f a few of the people there, including the admin... Uh, collaborate on that and um, so I'm kind of interested in seeing what they say about Germany some of the ideas that they've expressed in the videos I've seen so far I'm, I'm pretty disagreeable with but um, they're it's what I've seen so far at the site everybody <sighs> appears to get a, a pretty uh, open latitude as far as what they either what they believe or what they want to submit as <clears throat> evidence so that's that and i was going to do another let's consider luke today but the thing is i have been working like crazy to get through this book written by Steve Mason circa 2003 called Josephus in the New Testament. And the reason I got that <laughs> is because he had come on the Myth Vision podcast <clears throat> and um, as, as remarkably tedious as it was, and you know, for some people who actually criticize uh, the length of some of my videos for their tedium. Try a, try videos of that similar length with with literally nothing of substance being talked about. And if you, you want to know what I mean, just go and look at the last one that MythVision uh, posted. I'm talking to this Dr. Price guy who's a regular and if the conversation between Derek and this price doesn't drive you out of your mind, the people in chat will. It's like, I don't know how many people are, are commonly in there, but I guarantee you almost not one of them's actually thinking if these are genuine people, if, the, if, it, if this isn't just a, a, a deliberately crafted echo chamber, which I have a lot of suspicions that it is. Why? To give the to give this podcast more of a sense of veracity. Like, oh, there's so many people out there that are so, so jazzed about did I say jazzed? I did. <clears throat> Very excited to see or hear these guys talk about fucking nothing excuse my french um yeah you put that into google translate and it's still fucking nothing and that's what they're that's what they do over there <laughs> well among other things which <laughs> I'll, I'll save some of that criticism for another time <laughs> So anyways, I did decide to get his book because he did one particular, not Price, Mason, Steve Mason. He's a professor in Canada of some kind of philosophy or whatever, but <clears throat> obviously a big fan of the works of this character known as Josephus. So he writes this book, Josephus in the New Testament. He's also written various academic articles in the same sort of vein. I get it because I'm I'm interested now because now he's talking about all of these similarities which he claims are nearly impossible without the purported author of Luke Acts pulling from Josephus. And as soon as he started talking about this and citing examples and why he's exciting he he's citing examples based on certain bits of information and ways that it's conveyed that 
when you see it over and over and over and over again, you have to admit that there's a pattern there, and that's what interested me. Because you do. You do. When you see two sources that are citing the same kinds of information in similar ways, and they do it multiple times, that's a red flag. There are college professors and other academics, of course, that will cry plagiarism for exactly those sorts of things. They don't, it doesn't have to be somebody just straight lifting word-for-word um, -for -word text from another source because there's a lot of different ways to plagiarize. You can still plagiarize and not use word-for-word -word text. So yeah, um, the problem is he spends at least the first half of the book, and it's, it's just an apology for Josephus. It's mostly him trying to convince us of the veracity of the works of Josephus and the reality of him being a historical person. And, and it's kind of great, though, because I, I, I have more quotes regarding the inconsistency and therefore the untrustworthiness of Josephus than I ever hoped to get. Because for anybody who's actually read through the whatever translation you, you get of uh, the complete works of Josephus, whether you're trying to get through wars of the Jews, antiquities of the Jews, um, what against Appian, and then he has uh, essentially like an autobiography. They are... I, they will put you right to sleep. You will be seen cross-eyed within the first column of text because most of uh, the translations are presented in like two-column text, which I sometimes find very difficult to read too, but I mean, some people like that. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty amazing the things that you see when you start comparing the works of this character called Flavius Josephus to the works of Luke, Acts, Paul, that whole world, which seem, to me, they seem um, in stark contrast to what I see specifically in Matthew and Mark and other letters, like, say, uh, James, at least First Peter, Jude, because if the uh, Jude and Second Peter, uh, they, I don't know what's going on with those two, but there's there's obviously some sort of plagiarism or overlap between them. It doesn't seem like you could get prophets like if you read Isaiah and and Micah, um, they both have themes that just absolutely overlap. Um, this happens all the time with the Old Testament prophets. That's not what I'm talking about between Jude and, and um, Second Peter. It's 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 almost like just straight plagiarism with a little bit of variation. Maybe I'm wrong. It's the same way I feel about when I when I read Luke. There are all of these passages that seem to be lifted right out of Matthew and just tweaked a little bit here and there. It's just weird. So I'm because of all of this, I'm I'm actually putting more time into um, the critique of Luke, especially being in um, what is it, the Olivet Discourse right now. So there you go. Now I did want to just a little, just address a little bit. Some of the themes I've been to now she's snoring. Hey, 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 thank you. And she she's a loud snorer too. Um and I don't know if it picks up in this mic, but when I have these headphones on, this mic on, I can hear I can hear like I, I could hear a mouse um tiptoeing in the basement. It's amazing. So one thing I, I did want to discuss is the fact that, like some of the things that I've brought up the last few of these briefs, 
they've been kind of, you know, I, I hate that, that new speak term black pill. They've been a bit depressing. Sometimes the truth is depressing. Because, you know, a lot of times the truth shatters illusions, a fantasy world. You know, when we grow up and we find out things as we grow up, they're hard to find out. They are. And they shatter illusions we had and misconceptions. We and this happens a lot with with adults or figures that we we put on a pedestal a lot, and then we find out things about them that kind of knocks them down. But the good part about that is you find out these things about we'll say either your idols or your parents or or whatever that really knocks them down to size as you get older. And a lot of people probably don't like that process. Because it's, it's not fun and it's not easy. And I guess, you know, we don't like to see the things that we thought were uh, a little more spectacular, you know, that, that fed some sort of a, a, a need, an emotional or mental need that we had. We don't like to see those things dissolved. The plus to it, though, is that um, we can then see these people or these ideas for what they really are and grow into that, which is, in my opinion, it's far, far more fulfilling, um, educational, um, wisdom acquiring, and tempering than were we to live in that state of fantasy for the rest of our lives as little children. All right, so all that being said, a question and an observation. And keep in mind that these, these briefs, they're not always just to present facts. A lot of times they're just to think. They're what I'm thinking about. Maybe good things to think about. So, out of everyone, here's the question, out of everyone that you've ever known, that you've ever known or known of, we'll say that old neighbor, you know, that old guy you lived by, when you were a kid, whatever, known personally or known of. And that can even be known of in the, the public realm too, okay? How many of those people are you sure that are gone out of your sight, that are now unknown to you? Out of sight, out of mind. How many of those people are you sure you have very sure evidence that they are now dead? Now, I'm leaving that pause for a just a moment, because I think that's a very weird question. How many of the people that you've known, either in a, a pretty personal way or not, or known of, and this can be public figures, this can be presidents of the United States, and just known or known of, in your consciousness. And let's just say who, by this point in time, should 
probably really definitely be dead based on everything that we've come to be taught <clears throat> about the world and the way things work. How many of those people do you have any substantial evidence for them indeed being dead? How many of those people do we have good substantial evidence of their dates of birth? You see, people, people like you and I, people at the bottom, we have such a limited realm of knowledge. And we are taught so many things from the youngest age. <clears throat> and if you stop to think about it, there's so many ideas just inserted, oftentimes just very subtly inserted into pop culture that would reinforce a lot of things that we were taught from the earliest age so that they go in our minds and it just becomes a given. You know, there's expressions now that are just, they're kind of a common part of our vocabulary. You know, maybe he'll get his three score in 10. And the only two guarantees in life are death and taxes. Those kind of things. Now, I'm, I'm asking this because I personally, personally, I don't have definitive proof that everyone I've known or known of, who should by this point in time probably be dead, based on everything I've been taught about the way life works, and the way the aging process works, and so on and so forth, and what we should do to be healthy and live long, uh, good, productive, meaningful lives. Um, what I'm saying is I, I don't personally have the proof. Now, I don't have proof of a lot of things that happen. So I'm not saying just because we don't have proof in hand that it means it's not so. And I, I don't come on here to try to, like, push wild fantasies. That's not my... You, you can get wild fantasies from a lot of other sources. That's not what I'm into, and it's not what I'm all about. And in fact, if I could, <clears throat> I, would, I would cite far more sources than I'm able to. I'm simply just asking that question. Now, why is that? Well, for one thing, it's what I just said. That's another idea added to all of the other ideas that we have been instilled with from a very early age. That's just the way it goes. Most people are going to live out a certain, you know, predetermined lifespan. You can look into statistics and they will say statistically men live this long, statistically women live this long. And you do have some outliers, but basically that's your, your average statistical rate. Well, that's your average statistical rate for um, people at the bottom, like you and I. It's probably pretty average. Though a lot of people at the bottom live a heck of a lot longer than that. Um, drinking and smoking, and, you know. The, uh, the other thing is these ideas that they give us about what is going to keep you in good health, I think, is, is complete garbage, too. Uh, and a lot of the people that are supposed to be your friends in, like, alternative thought, whether it be religious or secular, I think they're feeding you a load of BS. <clears throat> About things like, well, if you eat this way or if you eat these things... And if you do these certain things, and if you don't do these certain things, then you're more likely 
to have this longevity or something like that, you know. <clears throat> and then you look at a guy like, I'll take for example, just because I've been revisiting some of his work lately. You take a guy like Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut, um, this is a guy who rarely ever exercised and heavily drank and smoked Pall Mall non-filters like his whole life from the time he was extremely young until <laughs> his death that I haven't substantiated. I don't know that it happened. I haven't seen the corpse. I haven't determined that he died. And I'm not saying he didn't. Maybe other people out there could confirm this. I could get multiple confirmations from, from various parties. And then if I did, maybe I would believe that. <laughs> I did just say maybe, yeah. But anyways, he did all these things that we're not supposed to do. And he didn't eat great either. A guy like almost never exercised. He was really pathetic looking form, <laughs> to be honest. And he lived very long life. Very long life. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so those things that, if they're really people telling you you should do this and this and this, maybe, maybe, what they're telling you is if you are, if you spend your whole life with your body and mind bound by this system and this world and this prison that they've created for your body and mind, that if you do these things, you stand a chance of living this certain amount of time. Maybe that's what they mean. I have no idea, and I'm just being honest. And I think most people, if they're listening, if they're being honest, they would, they would Confirm this is, I think, a pretty accurate statement. There's no proof that there aren't people walking around on the earth right now that are hundreds of years old. <clears throat> How they got to that age, I don't know. But I think a lot of us We have a tendency to perceive things based on the, the prison we're born into and the prison further created for our minds and our thoughts, how we think, the limitations that we'll put on our thoughts. And if you want to have a constant reminder of what the limitations of our thoughts are, always keep a normie close at hand and try not to give them too much because here's the thing I used to get really angry that you know most of the people I knew who were pretty much normies to one degree or another would not listen to evidence they would not listen to it and they wouldn't give it consideration for it being Good, valid evidence it used to make me so angry. And to a degree, <clears throat> it still does and it should. <clears throat> because if somebody has the ability to uh, take in information and think, come to a conclusion, then they should be held responsible for ignoring it. Sometimes you really have to wonder, and I do, how many people out there who have just spent decades with that prison for their bodies and their minds being reinforced even have the capacity to consider these things? Because you start saying things to them that are absolutely rational, reasonable questions, like that I just posed.
and they are absolutely impossible for them to comprehend. It's impossible. I don't know how much, I really don't know how much repeating something, even even in the um, the kindest way, where you're considering their mental state because you don't you don't want to the point is never to damage someone <laughs> we don't i it's not my purpose i don't want to cause somebody trauma by asking them certain questions <clears throat> and then pointing out certain things and i sometimes i do and i inadvertently i don't and what usually happens is if I forget myself and I forget who I'm talking to and I start hammering in a few things, it, if, if I'm aware and the whole time I'm presenting and what I'll do is usually I'll present a, a you know, a, an idea or a thesis, simple. And then I will cite certain problems with the accepted belief about it or limitations. And it's, it's kind of like putting in little roadblocks, you know, where you have to, you're leading somebody somewhere and not in a bad way, not in a manipulative way, but you're trying to get them from the way they think now to a, a little bit better way of thinking. Because every time you can do that, you break down a barrier. But typically when I do that, and this is something temperance, develop, being developed in time, I try to watch their body language, their face, the tone of their voice, because people get scared. If you can present information to them in a way that is reasonable, in, in ways that they can comprehend, and, and sometimes it does depend on their level of comprehension and intelligence. But if you can present those things to them and they, they're comprehending that information as you take them step by step, Start with the basic thesis. How do we know this? You'll see about how far you can go with them and then maybe backtrack. But that one's a big one. That one's not something I don't think you're going to be able to easily talk to a rational person about. <clears throat> a lot of people who like to live in fantasy land will entertain that, but they don't really want to get anywhere solid. They'll entertain anything, but they don't really want to go anywhere with good, solid answers, unfortunately. But I have to ask that. See, we all get this idea. Now, I think the, the basic accepted story, let's just say amongst religionists, Christians, is that, um, okay, all right, Adam and Eve were made with eternal life. This, is, this isn't necessarily what I believe. This is mainstream. <clears throat> they were made with eternal life. They were told, uh, basically, the only rule you've got is not to eat this fruit. And they did. So they lost that eternal life. And apparently... All of their descendants lost it until a point in time when God himself would come to earth and die for them in their place so that they could have that eternal life again, except not on earth, but then some people think on earth, but the caveat to getting that eternal life is believing in this God, the Son. Which, 
essentially the whole idea of Trinity is beyond anyone's comprehension. <laughs> Besides for the fact of the, uh, the very dubious <clears throat> claimed evidence of it in the Bible. But that's, I think that's a good rough sketch of what people think about why people don't live forever and then and then a lot of people have various beliefs about lifespans these days um and trust me there 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 does appear to be a good amount of evidence in the bible of a certain average lifespan as well, like a level off lifespan as well. And then you have the oddities of, for instance, Adam, <clears throat> who was told that, remember, Adam, who was told the day that you eat this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat that fruit, you'll die. <clears throat> of course, he didn't die, as in he wasn't executed. But a lot of people could make the argument that he began to die. Up to that point, he was entirely preserved. He had been given um, the gift of longevity, eternal life. And it was from that point that he lost it. And... I suppose you could say from that point, or maybe from the time he was created, he lived the 900, what is it, 9, Adam was 965 years. Then he takes the dirt nap, right? His son Seth, 900 some odd years, bop, 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 bop. and nearly every single one of those descendants of Adam, listed all the way to Noah, has that sort of longevity. I mean, even Noah, 500 years, um, I'm just going to go along with Flood and Ark story for now. That's fine. 100 years building this um, uh, Tibet Ark, and then 300 and some odd years after that. That's like 850 years right there. Pretty long life. Now, then, what, Seth, 600 and some odd years, right? And then all of a sudden you get down to around, um, as we know him, Eber, but that's actually Ober, and he's the really the patriarch of the language that uh, most of the Bible was written in, Obri, because it was around his time that the whole Genesis 11 thing happened with the um, confusion of languages, the dispersion of all of our people, the descendants of, of Noah that were actually together at that point in time. So Ober uh, got that sort of distinction, and then his children, Peleg and Yuktan, and, and then their children. So it was right around that time, too, that we see this, this huge, this sharp decline in lifespan. Now, in the Masoretic text, it's much sharper, and they literally are taking like a century away from each one of these people's lives to the point to where Shem outlives like four or five of his descendants. If you reference it in the Septuagint, though, he doesn't. But there still is a sharp decline in lifespan. And of course, this has led a lot of people to speculate on just anything, man. A greenhouse effect, you know, terrarium before the flood, uh, you know, a special dome, yes, and then no, but the thing is, we still see the same words used by the psalmist way after that, so that doesn't really work very well. There are people who have said, well, you know, Adam had a, a certain genetic characteristic that was given to him or 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 that he had from creation whatever they want to think maybe and that what happened was there was just a degeneration in time there's just a natural degeneration in time <clears throat> that um, 
you know, by the time we get to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we've got them living um, 175 years, 180 years, and then I think it's 139 years respectively. A couple centuries later, you've got Moses living 120 years. His brother Aaron, right around the same amount of time. You got Samuel living pretty long life, a couple hundred years after that. And that's the thing. Interesting, because now it seems like it's leveled out for a number of centuries. You might live 100, 120 years plus. Okay, the people who say that, um, like for instance in Genesis 6, when Yahweh says, um, my spirit will not always strive with man. This is the common English translation, my spirit will not always strive with man. His days will be 120 years. They're obviously not looking ahead because that didn't happen. Okay, even Abraham lived 175 years, Isaac 180, Jacob 139. And what's really funny about that, out of those three patriarchs, Isaac seems to be sort of the most <laughs> kind of selfish and actually has what we at least recorded the least amount of interaction or positive interaction with Yahweh, but he lives to be out of his father. And maybe Terah might have actually outlived Abraham pretty good. Terah might have lived about 200 years, 205 years, if I remember right. It's been a while since I've gone over that. But if we believe something like that, <clears throat> well, the age cut off, we see in Genesis 6, and Yahweh says man's days will be 120 years. Well, when did that start exactly? Because we do have records of men living really long lives here and there as we go. Now, we do have records of things like, for instance, if you pay attention to the lifespan of kings, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, especially post-Solomon, they get really short. Now, a lot of times they get really short because people are killing them. <laughs> And a lot of those kings, once once we get past like Rehoboam and Asa, so Solomon's son and grandson, um, these kings really, for the most part, just strike me as, as real degenerates. And, they, and they, they probably are, for the most part. You have a few good ones. You have Hezekiah, but he still doesn't live a really long life. I think Hezekiah might have gone like 50, 60. That's it. And he was a really righteous king. His uh, grandson or great-grandson Josiah was, he's called in the Bible one of the, the most righteous kings since David, as Hezekiah. Josiah dies at 39 because he decides to go to war against Pharaoh. He's warned by Pharaoh, not Yahweh, not that I've seen, not to go because Pharaoh actually tells him, he tells him, why, why are you coming out to make war with me? It doesn't have anything to do with you. He says, Yahweh has given the king of Asher into my hand. This is for me to do. Why should you come out and die? And I don't know why, honestly, why he would do that. But he does, and he dies. 39. But then, you know, we, we see other figures who live very long lives after that, and cross the 120-year mark. You know, who's that, who's that guy that's... It's Willard Scott, isn't it? He's got that little thing on, like, the Today Show or something where anybody who has 100 years or more, maybe that send in and tell him, he tells them happy birthday, if it's their birthday, and he says how old they are, right? I don't really watch that regularly, but I wonder how many people reach 120 and over. I just, I sometimes find it very hard to believe that certain people died when they did, how they did. And the funny thing about the people at the top, who got a lot of information I don't, and who have very strange and peculiar ways of acting. And I have a lot of suspicion concerning their origins, where they came from. I think the people at the very top, many of them came from the old world just as 
We did. We is in a lot of the people at the bottom. Not all. A lot. And that a number of them are indeed the descendants of the Samaritans from 2 Kings 17. I don't have hard proof of that. No, I don't. These, a lot of these are, are hunches. But I think based on the way they behave, um, I think they've learned a lot. I think they like being in control of the world. And that's a lot. For anybody who's ever been in control of one person, whether it's because you've been a manager somewhere or you've just had um, just the opportunity. I'm not saying that, you, you know, you gladly, you know, love the opportunity of being in control of other people. There is a sense of power, of course, in when you can tell other people, I need you to do this or this. You don't have to be a slave driver or, or mean about it, but, it, you know, that is a sense of power. That is more intoxicating. And you're talking about, you're talking to a guy who was an old school, like long-term hard drug user for a long time. And th that feeling and the uh, the endorphins, the dopamine, whatever it is that you get from that, you can't get with anything I have ever even heard of. And I'm just talking about having a certain degree of influence over just a few people. Think about it. Think about how unwilling these people are to give up their power and what lengths they're willing to go to and have for centuries now. They've learned. They have learned and grown. And us, not so much. But, you know, probably uh, maliciously, in a way. I think they probably, they definitely have good, uh, accurate, pure manuscripts of the Bible, and they know what it's saying. They have given us very inaccurate, very impure versions of the Bible. I think one of the reasons why they didn't rewrite when they couldn't get rid of it or couldn't get it out of our hands, why they didn't just rewrite the manuscripts, but instead changed things about it and put all their Nakud all over it because they were concerned if they did, they could really mess things up for them retaining power. I think to a large degree, they absolutely believe in the principles expressed in the Bible concerning the law, and they believe that they can gain a whole lot of longevity and retain their power should they keep at least these two up to a certain point. I believe they also believe that if they can, in a soft way, get us to be lawlessness or lawless, that we will remain at the bottom and that we will experience hardship, curses, death, early death. I think there is a, a method in what they do. I think there is I think there is a morbidity and a certain degree of psychotic sickness whether it's just in their genes or where it comes from but I do believe there is a, a, a very intelligent very well thought out um and very well practiced methodology in what they do. And I think if you reduce everything to relatively simple uh, understandings of human nature, we can better understand what the people at the top do, what the people at the bottom do, and, and why. And I have to wonder how long these people actually live and what it is they're doing, what it is they keep from us. I don't really have to ask the why, because I think the why is pretty simple. They love their power. 
power is unbelievable power over people it's it is it is and i'm not sitting here reveling in it like oh it's just so i've just experienced it in a lot of various ways and people who have experienced it, really experienced it, and they know the, the sort of the way that it can make you feel, they will not easily give it up. And you, now you're talking about people who have power over hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, billions. And that's just the people. Because if you have power over people, you have power over so much more that those people can do and harness and so on and so forth. They'll never give it up. They will never give it up. They will never give it up. They will never admit what they've done to gain and retain it. Never, never, Never. And I guess just as an end segue, that leads me to the state of affairs now. For those out there thinking that we can back off, like somehow we're going to get back the good old days 20 years ago or something, get that out of your head. They can't back off. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. They're going to have to do something very similar to what they did a century ago and two centuries ago and who knows for how long where they separate children from parents, kill off the parents, re-educate the children. I don't know that they want full genocide. I'm not saying they don't, but I'm saying I don't know that. But certainly those methods have been used in the past and very effectively. Of course, they've learned. So who knows what they've got in mind now. But if we look into the history good enough and we understand things about human nature, we should be able to determine a lot of things by that. Like, for instance, what they did with the Spanish flu, where it most likely came from, how they capitalized on those uh, effects, or capitalized on those effects, Maybe they caused them. They obviously would know pretty much every kind of technology that can be used or harnessed, and I'm sure they keep the best ones out of the public domain, and certainly they put the most damaging, detrimental ones very much in the public domain. I think that's just rational, logical thought. But before I start rabbit trailing, I'm almost at an hour. These are supposed to be brief, so I'm going to cut it off there, and I'll see you guys next time.